bit on the motion. Minister. This budget was constructed in unprecedented circumstances. The restoration of the executive in January and the Chancellor's budget on the 11th of March meant there was a limited period in which to develop this budget. In addition, the budget has been overshadowed by the outbreak of COVID-19. In his budget on the 11th of March, the Chancellor announced initial measures in response to the economic disruption caused by COVID-19. The allocations arising from these measures were included in the statement I provided to the Assembly on the 16th of March 2020. Since then, the British Government has made further announcements on funding for the response to COVID-19, and while some of the measures apply here, the Executive receives Barnet consequences on any funding provided for England only. Legislation prevented me from including further COVID-19 funding in the budget subsequently laid on 31 March. However, the Executive has taken the COVID-19 response forward separately. While the budget outcome does not reflect the full COVID-19 funding, the budget document does contain details of how departments are responding to the challenges presented by the pandemic. It also outlines the measures which have received additional funding so far. The Executive has allocated funding to support businesses, to maintain public services, including our health service, and to protect the vulnerable. Although our block grant has still not been restored to its pre-austerity levels in real terms, the Executive has been able to support businesses and households. Domestic regional rates, which are already relatively low, have been frozen. The non-domestic regional rate has been reduced by 4p in the pound, which combined with the reval will see average bills fall by 18%. A three-month rates holiday has been provided to all businesses to help them cope with the lockdown. All departments have received real-term increases. The Executive has prioritised our key services with the non-ring-fence resource budget for health, breaking £6 billion for the first time and education be given an 11 per cent increase from its baseline. The budget will also see £1.6 billion allocated to capital investment. Ministers have been given flexibility to reallocate the resources so they can respond to the new challenges created by COVID-19. This budget is presented in very difficult circumstances, but it offers a platform to support businesses, maintain public services and protect the vulnerable during this crisis. And I commend the budget to the Assembly. Uh, you'd be pleased to know I don't intend to take my 58 minutes, uh, <laughs> although I, I kind of get a sense of revenge for sitting through four hours of all the rest of you. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I'd like to thank the members and the committee chairs for their participation in this debate. Uh, I thank those members who are supportive of the budget proposals for their input, and I listened with interest uh, to members who have spoken against the budget, though, as is always the case, I've heard demands for a litany of more expenditure and no uh, propositions for where in a finite budget then we're going to cut if we want to spend more in other areas uh, and it's quite often the case you will get a list of things that we should be spending money on uh, but no suggestions as to where we should be taking that money from uh, but nonetheless members are free to get up and make their points and write their statements accordingly. I intend to use uh, the remainder of my time to respond to a lot of the issues that have been raised and I'll try and be as constructive uh, as possible. Uh, can I thank the committee chair for the, uh, from the Finance Committee for the committee's work in, in relation to this? Uh, he did raise an issue in relation to further uh, vote of account that we will, we will need in the coming weeks. Uh, and, and obviously there is a recognition from I think nearly all speakers that we are in very unique circumstances. We were in unique circumstances when we came back in January and that has just uh, greatly multiplied uh, over the last number of weeks. Uh, and of course, that has then put a stress in terms of uh, some departments have had to spend much more than anticipated. Other departments are spending much less, uh, and that will make for a, a challenging June monitoring round. Uh, but I can assure you that the second voting account is not based on this 2021 budget. It will be based on a high percentage of the 2019-20 expenditure, and it is a technical approach to make sure that departments have the authority to spend uh, to continue to operate through this period when uh, this bill may not have completed its legislative passage. Uh, so uh, I think the, it, the, this is necessary because the time simply does not permit the production of the detailed main estimates document, and given the fast evolving COVID-19 situation and the spend associated with it, the budget may be out of date by the time the bill could be passed. So, of course, uh, we will engage with the committee in relation to that, and I will bring the main estimates along with a further budget bill to the Assembly in the autumn, uh, by which time we would hope that the financial position will have stabilised somewhat. Uh, but we do certainly do need to ensure that the, uh, that the departments can continue to spend money. Uh, the 
Chair of the Communities Committee raised uh, the issue of additional funding for councils. Uh, and I'm aware that the Communities Minister is working with the councils to finalise pressures, and I expect to see a paper in relation to that. You need to bear, bear in mind that the £50 million Barnet Consequential that came from England uh, applies to a different set of functions related to councils than it does here. Councils in England have functions in relation to social services, in relation to education, all of which we have had to spend money on here uh, uh, from our own budgets. Uh, so, of course, there will be a loss of revenue, and we recognise that to the councils. And, uh, we, uh, we want to ensure that we, we support them how we can, but there also will be an opportunity for councils to save, as I said, in relation to the, I think the rates debate earlier, uh, uh, quite a lot of issues the councils, again, like ourselves who had budgeted, uh, anticipating a certain outcome this year, now will not be able to spend money on that. And we look to the councils to, uh, in the first instance, look to themselves and see what savings can be found from that. Uh, she also raised the issue of capital funding for the uh, Department for Communities and, and, and some, uh, the issue around flexibility and, and certainty around all of that. And of course, uh, I have asked departments to look most acutely at, at capital spend pro, uh, projections because uh, we have already lost f effectively the first quarter of this year. We may lose uh, a significant proportion of the second quarter of this year. Uh, and we may not get the flexibility people might anticipate at the end of the financial year from Treasury. We would hope that we will, but there are no guarantees in relation to that. So particularly in relation to capital budgets, uh, we have asked departments to look uh, to see uh, early what they think they can spend and what they may not be able to spend and to try and work with us in relation to that. And I have to say it's a, it's a, a mixed bag in terms of, of, of the department's response to that. I, I noted the... Uh, the impassioned uh, opinion of the Chair of the Justice Committee, uh, who, who I think made the point very well from a committee perspective that they are, want to look to departments to play their part in ensuring that we do not end up uh, in the early part of next year, at the end of our financial year, surrendering significant proportions of money back to Treasury that people had held on to uh, in anticipation of spend that we were not able to, uh, to spend. Yeah, well, sure. Way. Obviously, he has had, had some conversation with the Chief Secretary of the Treasurer, but could he confirm to the House that while many members come to this House and we talk aspirationally as to what we should do and so on, he has the power to write to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and to set out in detail that particular issue around flexibility, because if ever there was an opportunity now for us to make the argument in these circumstances that justified the flexibility, now is the time to do that and will he commit to ensuring that that is the case, if he has not already done so? I can assure the, the member uh, that I have a weekly conversation with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and of course we, we do write to him as well. Uh, I have recently written to him on another issue, which I will raise shortly in relation to uh, uh, supply teachers. Uh, but yes, we have raised that, and yes, we get assurances. Uh, he will know that at the very tail end of the last financial year, the Treasury made an adjustment which forced us uh, into a readjustment of our capital budget, which thankfully we were able to carry over this year. But we have argued uh, that, that rather than uh, and give us Barnet consequences which are above perhaps what they may be able to deliver, that we can get the baseline of that so we don't end up having to readjust later in the year. And we have also argued for flexibility, but this is a very uncertain picture. Uh, and while I do welcome, and people have made that, I do welcome the interventions that have been from Treasury in relation to employee retention and in relation to support for, uh, for uh, the self-employed. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there is no doubt that Treasury will be looking to recoup as much money as it can as the year goes on. Uh, and so, while we are asking and will press the case, and uh, the meetings I do with them uh, quite often joined by the Scottish Finance Minister and the Welsh Finance Minister, we have very similar issues to raise with them. So, it is not just a demand from here, uh, but also from other devolved areas. Uh, and we will continue to press that case because it's, it will be key in the time ahead. But I think departments need to help us out in the here and now in making sure we do not end up in a situation at the end of the year where we have a significant portion of money we are trying to, to, to uh, reallocate. Uh, just in relation to the sub-teachers, yeah, that is another issue. The, the, uh, can I just say in relation to that, I mean, the, uh, so, and people will understand this, and certainly the member who last spoke and, and other members who have been here a longer time, when, when a range of bids come in from departments and the executive uh, have a, a limited amount of funding, and we agree how that funding will be allocated, we also agree then the funding that's not allocated. Uh, and so the, the bid in relation to supply teachers was not supported. Uh, because we had a limited and uh, priorities went to other areas. That means the executive also agreed not to, uh, to put money into that at, at this time. Uh, now, since that, I have had uh, several discussions with the uh, 
Education Minister, because I do recognise uh, a number of speakers have mentioned the issue of supply teachers and sub teachers. And I do recognise, and we put the case very firmly to the Treasury, that while people in England and Scotland and Wales, supply teachers normally come from an agency, uh, and therefore that agency could have them furloughed. Uh, here they come in a very random fashion off a list, which are essentially very much self-employed, uh, and that they don't have that, that uh, overarching organisation which can bid for furlough on their behalf. Uh, and so we have pressed that case, and we're continuing to press that case. Both myself and the Education Minister wrote to the Treasury, and I raised it over the course of two meetings, including last Thursday with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and we're awaiting a response to that. So we have not forgot the issue. We'll continue to press for that uh, a, a, in, uh, in relation to trying to get some support uh, from that. I think the, the Chair of the Education Committee, uh, Chris Little, raised the issue of uh, capital funding uh, from the shared uh, uh, in, and integrated education fund, the Fresh Start uh, funding, and there has been uh, 36 million provided to education for shared and integrated education in 2021, and we're in discussion again with the Treasury in relation to profile uh, of money for uh, future years. Uh, the Chair of the uh, Infrastructure Committee raised uh, several issues, uh, particularly in relation to Translink, and some other uh, speakers have, have mentioned this, and, uh, and uh, I think Matthew O'Toole also asked where uh, you know, the COVID funding that, uh, that the Department of Infrastructure uh, have said that they haven't had. I think uh, Andrew Moore raised it as well. We have, there, there has been, I think, 1.2 billion of COVID-related funding has come across from Treasury. We have already allocated or identified over 900 million of that, uh, either spent already in terms of the lion's share of it went to business support measures, I think over in around half a billion. Uh, obviously, a significant proportion to health, to communities, to protect the vulnerable people, to education, and some of the interventions that we've made there. And we have set aside 95 million for transportation issues. Now, to say that the Department of Infrastructure hasn't got any of that isn't strictly accurate because they have already allocated uh, money to support the airports, to support the ferries, to ensure that the, that, that continues. We are waiting on a proposition from in relation to freight, which I know they are working with the Department of Transport on, and we have also indicated that there will be funds for TransLink within that. So, uh, while it, it might be strictly accurate that they haven't got the funding for TransLink uh, as we stand, we have set aside money for that, and that's clearly understood by the Department uh, of Infrastructure. And the issue of furloughing TransLink workers is a matter for the Infrastructure Minister. What we did was what we were asked to do, which was ask Treasury what the issue was, uh, what the situation was in relation to furloughing public sector workers. And we were given the criteria by which some public sector workers may be furloughed, including some council staff. The decision of whether to go and apply for that is a matter for the Minister involved, or a matter for the Council involved, as to whether they seek to furlough uh, those workers. We were asked to provide uh, the information, and that we did. That decision making in relation to that then is down to the individual Minister. Sure. You said to furlough, and you said for the Minister, uh, that for that individual uh, uh, department, would it not be for the executive as a whole? No, I don't think necessarily it would. Uh, no more than if an individual council uh, wanted to furlough certain workers, uh, perhaps uh, workers on the leisure side, that can't be redeployed elsewhere, and that have certainly where the, 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 the council have lost income as a council. That's one of the key factors. You have to have lost income, so that means it would apply to TransLink. Uh, where it wouldn't necessarily apply to public sector workers uh, across the board, uh, that the council has or the, uh, the department's lost income. Then it is a matter for each department to uh, consider whether they wish to make a case to Treasury to follow those workers or not. That's, if they decide not to, then of course they manage their budgets accordingly. Uh, so I, I think there are a number, as I say, uh, Paul Given had raised. Uh, issues in, uh, in relation to what, what is required by the department. He specifically was re referring, obviously, to the Department for Justice, but I think the points that he made uh, can apply equally, and I, I would say that to all committee chairs and committee members here, uh, that, that it is incumbent on all of us, because I mean, we, we come here to be scrutinised, quite rightly so, by the Assembly. Uh, each minister and each department and each of the committees have a very important role in relation to that, which I uh, absolutely welcome. But we, we have to ensure it, none of us have faced into a situation like this before, where uh, certain departments have had to spend a significant amount of money, but other, other areas where they had planned spend will not happen. 
uh, and we need to make sure uh, in terms of our ability to respond to this, to try and assist in emerging from this, to try and support the economy, the vulnerable in society, the health service, uh, and all of the issues which members have raised, that we ensure that money is properly allocated throughout the course of the rest of the year, and we don't end up in a situation where we have departments sitting on money uh, and there's a, some sort of scramble beyond January to try and spend out money. Uh, so I think the committees, uh, as well as the departments, have work to do in that regard. Uh, uh, the Chair of the Health Committee, Colin Gillenew, raised issues around the new decade, new approach uh, priorities, and, and he's quite correct that there hasn't been sufficient funding provided uh, by the British Government in relation to what was committed under new decade, new approach. The Executive have allocated £81 million to the Department of Health for transformation and £5 million for safe staffing. Uh, those commitments were included in the new decade approach, uh, but obviously in light of the impact of COVID-19, the Department had to reallocate some of its transformation allocation to meet other priorities, uh, and obviously uh, the Executive would need to look through that and agree uh, to that. Uh, the, issue of, uh, uh, just the issue of special education needs was mentioned by uh, a number of speakers, uh, both I think Daniel McCrossan and Karen Mullen. Uh, issue that, uh, or mentioned that, and in this budget, we have, uh, and I'm, I'm, I was very pleased that we were able to do that, uh, provide an additional 42 million uh, to have ring fenced for this important issue, and it will go some way. And we're not uh, claiming that it addresses all of the pressures in relation to that, but it certainly goes some way to address existing pressures to meet the needs of children and young people with special educational needs, and it's a very important step towards addressing those known uh, pressures in relation to all of that. Uh, the, uh, Paul Frew raised issues in relation to ongoing rate relief. And he, he made the remark that the, the rates is a fairly small amount of our, our resource, but it's 1.3 billion in the last financial year, which uh, by anybody's reckoning is a fairly substantial amount. Uh, but we have to. Uh, he also argued, I think, in relation to the. the where he wanted to see a more strategic approach in relation to this budget. And of course, that's what we want to do. We recognised when we set this out, before we knew the, the depth of what we were in, that this was an unusual uh, and, and, and time-limited approach to this. The objective clearly is to get to a multi-annual uh, budget approach, where I, I would think uh, and hope and, and, and certainly prepare and plan for a much more strategic approach over a number of years. I think it allows us to get uh, much more certainty about going forward. I think anyone recognises that we are in, in far from ideal times in terms of budget uh, preparation. The, and I can confirm, yes, that the increase he asked about in relation to uh, the Executive Office budget uh, was in relation to the historical institutional abuse redress uh, allocation. Uh, uh, and and that, that's what created that significant increase in relation to their budget. Uh, a number of, of uh, members asked about the idea of how we, we kind of pay our way out of this and, and, and try and uh, secure as much resource as we possibly can uh, and, and raise the issue of borrowing. Uh, the executive can access up to £200 million of borrowing, and this is only be able to, to be able to use in the, the RRI. It's only be able to use for capital uh, expenditure. It would, couldn't be used for resource costs such as grants to business or to help with running costs without the agreement of Treasury. Uh, additionally, it should be remembered that it does come at a cost, and we have already significant existing borrowing of some £2.5 billion, uh, which has cost £169 million uh, in terms of repayments in 2020-2021. Uh, so I, I think there, you know, it's, it's always seen as a, a kind of a, a quick fix in terms of what we, we might want to spend to try and secure uh, an emergence from what the situation we're in. But people have to remember that we have uh, significant borrowing. There are restrictions in terms of how it can be used. Uh, and there is a significant cost in terms of, of repaying that. And bear in mind that people are arguing, and I know others have argued for you know, capital spend as a way of, of trying to kickstart economic recovery. There is significant capital spend that should have been happening in the first quarter of this year, but it won't happen. And departments do have to look to what they have themselves uh, to try and assist uh, with the priorities of the executive in that regard. Uh, the, uh, I, I think Matthew O'Toole Matthew also asked about air passenger duty. Uh, it's, they previously made a commitment to the executive made a commitment to eliminate air passenger duty and the 2.3 million budget allocation. Uh, represent the agreed block grant reduction to, devo to devolve the power uh, uh, to, to set APD from 2012, actually. And the cost relates to the duty amount that was payable on devolving the power to set the rate, not the duty on what would be payable in respect of current flights. Uh, the, uh, 
the, the, the former finance minister who did the last budget here uh, has, has, has given us a very stern lecture about the, the missing years. Can I remind him that we would have had a budget in 2018-19 and 2019-20 had his own party not walked away from a deal uh, that we reached with them. Uh, and their, their leadership are quite prepared to accept, but party members scuppered that deal. So, uh, while he might claim, he might claim, uh, can I just finish the point? He might allocate four years of missing budgets to us. I can assure him, at least two to three of them were responsible of his own party. The minister for Gavin Way might as well get a bit of uh, discussion going because we're not going to be going too far this evening. Other than the board of governors meeting right off at seven o'clock, but uh, it, it doesn't do the minister well to try and shift the blame. The reality for him and his party is they decided to pull the institutions down. The late Martin McGuinness decided collectively, what, maybe not, but whoever it was, decided to pull the institutions down. And would the minister at least accept that in doing so, he created further problems for children with special education needs, further crisis in the health service, further challenge to the unemployed. And as a result of that, he can't therefore in this house tonight try and do a Pontius pilot and wash his hands and say it was somebody else's. The letter, I have the letter with me, it was Martin McGuinness, the late Martin McGuinness and his party that decided to do the, the job. So don't try and blame the DUP. Well, can, can I say in relation to his own remarks where he, he, he heaped shame across the chamber at the party opposite uh, and exactly did what he's now accusing me of doing, uh, ignored the build-up to the inevitable collapse in the executive uh, and the role of his own party. And, and senior party members in his own, his own side have acknowledged that there are lessons to be learned. And I think we all will learn lessons in relation to all of that. Uh, but let's not try and, and uh, rewrite history in relation to what caused the issues what caused the issues and how long ago they could have been fixed. Uh, and we could have had an executive and a budget, as I say, for 2018-19 and 2019-20 delivered in this House uh, had things turned out differently. Uh, can I also say to him that uh, he does make the points in relation to support for the PSNI, uh, financial support, uh, not just, uh, I know uh, Mr O'Toole uh, corrected him in terms of the, 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 the fact that we actually paid taxes across the Treasury, and that's, that's a, a substantial proportion of the block grant that returns. But I did allocate a £4 million very recently in the last number of weeks uh, for additional support for the PSNI, so uh, I'm sure he would acknowledge that uh, as part of a, a, an allocation. And uh, yes, of course, there was a proposition to increase the number of PSNI offices officers as part of the, the uh, agreement to reform the executive. Uh, and I've had some discussions with the Justice Minister, and he will know from his own presence at the Gleason Board, you can't simply go out tomorrow and recruit 700 police officers, and that commitment still stands. And I, I'm, I'm sure he will equally uh, reaffirm his own commitment to things like the Irish Language Act uh, to make sure that the, the agreement that we reached is honoured uh, in, all its, in all, its, all its forms. Uh, give away again. Here again, we are seeing played out in this House is a classic example. If we don't get what we are looking for, you won't get. But the problem is, it's not in the budget. That's the problem. It's on a piece of paper which says we will increase the members of the place to 7,500, but no financial commitment. Yet we have a financial commitment in this document of 15 million to a medical centre in Londonderry that the business case today doesn't stack up for. And then we're told by the members of the SDLP and Sinn Féin about oh, making sure that everything has to be done properly. And we have to have scrutiny. scrutiny. We, have to, like, we, we can't have any, anything done which is improper. If you don't have a business case which stacks up, why have you allocated £15 million to something which is not financially viable? I can say, if he, he had a list, listened to me, I said I had a discussion with the Justice Minister as part of the budget allocation. Uh, and there's no bid to come forward from Justice, he'll, he'll know, for that additional recruitment. So they, they need time to work that up, to work out how that would, how that would uh, be shaped up and how they would begin. Because as I said, you can't simply recruit 700 police officers overnight. Uh, so, there, uh, and that, I have said, there clearly is a commitment uh, to meeting that. What he will know, uh, that will require Justice to come forward with propositions and uh, bid uh, in relation to supporting that uh, particular area. In relation to the, the additional 55 million for the, uh, the uh, Futures Fund, 
that we, we announced yesterday, the executive agreed on, yes, yesterday it was, uh, we're all losing track of days here, uh, uh, which was fully supported by the executive. Uh, of course, uh, only a proportion of that is in relation to the, the graduate entry medical school. There are other much needed uh, projects for Derry and for the North West generally, and that is a commitment in principle. Uh, to spend that. Those projects will have to be assessed, they will have to stack up, and they will have to pass the, the necessary scrutiny and tests that any uh, expenditure, public expenditure would meet. Uh, so that's, that's clearly going to be the approach there. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it was a very important signal to the North West to, uh, to ensure that the Executive was making that commitment again, which was something that we had agreed to in the NDNA document. Uh, Pat Catney raised issues, and I get exactly, I understand his passion in relation to uh, supporting small businesses. Uh, can I say that you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, it, the responsibility in terms of the £25,000 grant is the Department for the Economy, and they have, a, 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 they have an additional £40 million that we set aside to address what they call a business hardship fund, which is intended to target those who have fallen through the gaps of existing uh, small business grant schemes. And, and uh, I know that there was a paper brought forward uh, recently in relation to that, and that's currently going through the uh, processes of executive uh, approval. Uh, and of course, then, as I had said in relation to the rates debate, uh, we have a clear understanding that of the challenges facing the hospitality. Uh, uh, tourism and leisure industries, and in relation to the rates relief package which we offer to all businesses, including small industrial, uh, and, and again the, the small industrial got access to the 10k grants uh, as well, which wasn't in the initial package, uh, but we included that rates relief to all businesses here, which wasn't the case in, in the English scheme, uh, that we will have a specific focus on those who we know are going to continue to struggle. Uh, even if restrictions are lifted and businesses can start again, some businesses clearly will not be able to start in the way uh, that they had, they had operated just a, a short number of weeks ago. So uh, we will clearly look to do and to provide all of the support that we possibly can. Uh, sorry, the, uh, some other questions uh, were raised. Uh, can I say that the, uh, the figure uh, is interesting that uh, Mr. Alistair had, has, has Wax lyrical. Uh, interestingly, my own party leader was criticised for, for making a constitutional point in relation to COVID, uh, and we have a whole range of constitutional points uh, raised from across the floor here uh, in relation to the, the British government and the funding we have received, which I have said I have, I have very much welcomed. Uh, the, uh, he asked a question about the confidence and supply funding, and I have secured confidence and supply funding for 2021, and I expect the remainder to be provided in future years. Uh, he will know, because I have told the House before that the previous Secretary of State informed us that the conference supply money was gone, it was over, it was, we, there was no, nothing more to be got. So I was pleased that we did manage to secure this year's, and I, as I say, I intend to continue the battle to secure the future years, because uh, not that it was something uh, negotiated by my own party or by the Executive generally, but it was a commitment uh, from the Conservative Party uh, to here uh, for, for a number of years, and we, we want to see that commitment honoured. Uh, thanks, thank you, the Finance Minister. I just wanted to wonder if Mr. Allister, he was talking about the block grant, and he, he insisted that annually managed expenditure, i.e., Amy, was in the block grant funding. I just wanted to draw the Minister's attention to a Treasury document, or Her Majesty's Treasury document, as I'm sure Minister Allister would prefer. It's known, my former employer. It's very clear. It's the, the document's called Block Grant and Transparency. It was published in December 2018 and makes clear that departmental expenditure limits, i.e., Dell, is the block grant. AME is outside the block grant. So I just wanted to draw that to the House's attention and Mr. Allister's. Uh, can I thank the member for anticipating my next point? <laughs> I was going to <laughs> quote from a similar document, and that's the statement of funding policy. It says funding from the UK government to the devolved administrations falls into two broad categories: block grant or Dell funding, and funding in relation to annual managed, annually managed expenditure. Amy, this chapter covers the element of the block grant funding that relates to UK government departmental spending within the departmental expenditure limits. Dell. Uh, so, I mean, I hope that clears the matter up for him. Uh, that is that's a statement of funding policy that has come uh, from, from the British government itself. Uh, and I, of course, the, uh, he, he, he takes me to task over the, the, the description of the fiscal deficit. 3.3 3 billion of a fiscal deficit is not an insignificant figure. If somebody is sitting on universal credit at the moment, it is a very significant figure. So I have always acknowledged that. But what I have said is that the figure that has been bandied about, about 10, 11, 12 billion. 
uh, of, of a deficit being met by the British Government has been inaccurate, and the figures that I provided uh, during the last debate were figures that were worked out by the Department of Finance, not by me on my own. You'd be pleased to know. Uh, a number of uh, people have made points in relation to the multi-annual bu budgets. I've, I've, I've addressed that, and others have, uh, uh, have and, and the, the, the ability of that to give us more certainty and the recognition that we are in far from satisfactory circumstances at the moment. But nonetheless, uh, I have to say that even though it's not satisfactory, I do believe that the executive uh, uh, the ministers, supported by the Assembly, have risen to the challenge, have responded as best as they possibly can, have managed to get a very significant amount of money out on the ground to support not only our health service in terms of uh, fighting this pandemic, but also support our economy and other vulnerable people in society as well through very quick interventions. Interventions which would normally, uh, if, if we were operating in normal circumstances, would probably take six months of planning. Uh, of road testing, of consultation, uh, schemes which have been turned around in a number of days uh, or, or maybe weeks have been got out. So uh, I, I do recognise that we are in far from ideal times in terms of scrutiny, but we also then have a duty to respond as quickly as we can to one of the most serious issues I think any of us have ever faced in our lifetime in terms of the public health challenge. Uh, so I, I, I also would, would say that clearly uh, several people have mentioned the new decade, new approach, and, and quite clearly we have not got, uh, despite those who have, who have uh, wallowed in the comfort of the, uh, of the support that the British Government has given us, and I welcome that, they certainly have not given us the commitments that they did make under new decade, new approach, and I intend to continue to pursue that with Treasury at every opportunity, uh, because that was a commitment they made to all parties. And just as our political and commitments to various sections of that agreement and deal uh, are held to, and quite rightly held to, uh, so too must the government's commitments uh, to it as well. Uh, last kind of quarter, it's the responsibility of the Finance Minister to bring budget proposals before the House, and it's the responsibility that I take seriously, uh, particularly now when our citizens are facing such uncertainty in terms of the future. The Executive's main focus at this time has to be on getting funding where it needs to be to address the COVID-19 issues. And in a world where future economic, social and health landscape is uncertain, it's imperative that we provide the platform that is needed for public services to respond to changing demands. The budget seeks to support key services now and is a platform for the future responsive planning going forward. Uh, last concord on that note, I would commend the budget to the Assembly for its approval. Thank you.